Okay, it looks like we are live. Welcome everyone to the Wilds Cast MGE's podcast, and welcome to my good friend Saul Blinkoff. What an honor! Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much for having me, and excited to at least virtually be meeting the MGE family. So oh, thanks for God. having me. It is a pleasure. I'll say it's a pleasure to have you back, and because uh, Saul was a uh, an MJE regular for quite a while, years, years back. And we'll get to that in a minute, but welcome back. And uh, yeah, I would love to see you in person. Uh, just a little bio for those of you tuning in and uh, learning about Saul Blinkoff for the very first time. Saul began his career as an animator for the Walt Disney Studios, working on the hit film Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mulan, did I pronounce that right? Mulan, Mulan. <laughs> okay, Killed Mulan. Sorry. Mulan, Tarzan. I know Tarzan. I watched it with all of my four kids, like numerous there you times. Go. There you go. Uh, he made his um, directorial debut with a hip action adventure series, Spy Groove, which was on MTV. And after he rejoined Disney, directing the films Winnie the Pooh, Springtime with Rue, and Kronk's New Groove, starring Eartha Kitt and David Spade. How was that? Yeah, that was good. That oh, was good. good. All right, good. Yeah. Now, Saul has also been an unbelievable consultant on a number of other Disney films, Tinkerbell, Fox, Hound 2, Brother Bill, Brother Bear 2. Basically, a lot of Disney movies. There you lot, go. Listen, I am proud. <laughs> you don't need to name them all. I am proud. And, and this, is, this, is, this is what they call in Hebrew, yichus. Okay, this there you go. Food. This is unbelievable. All right, I'm going to go on another, but he was a director on the smash hit Disney show, Doc Mc, McStuffins. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> almost almost killed that one, too. <laughs> um, cons <laughs> consulting producer on the Stinky and Dirty Show. Love that. Uh, both for Amazon and for Netflix. Um, he was also consulting director on the hit show Barbie Dreamhouse. Adventures, Barbie Dreamhouse Adventures. Excuse. There you go. There you and go. Supervising director on Llama Llama, starring Jennifer Gardner. That's right. You got that. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, lastly, and this is true now, Saul is the supervising producer on the DreamWorks hit show Madagascar. There you go. There and you go. Now, that is usually <laughs> impressive, but there are three much more impressive things about Saul Blinkoff that you need to know before we have our conversation. Number one, he's a proud MG alumni. As I mentioned, he used to be a regular at MGE, and he is now a proud, learned, and observant Drew. Um, I will never forget bumping into you, Saul, in Israel leading a trip to Israel. MG was on our trip and you were leading yours. So Saul is an unbelievably inspirational leader in the Jewish Thank community. You. He's married to an extraordinary woman, Marion, who we absolutely adore, has four beautiful children. Um, some of them have been actually all of them voiceovers in some of your Disney films. Yeah, they've all done a lot of different things. Actually, none of the things that I've done have my kids been. Oh, yeah, one. There was one. But uh, they've had their own careers outside of Daddy. And we can talk about that later, too. Oh, I want to hear about that. That's amazing. The other thing you need to know is that uh, Saul is a blow-away motivational speaker. And I say this from firsthand experience, having had the zuchut, the merit of hearing Saul a couple of Passovers ago. Uh, we were both co-scholars and residents at one of those wonderful hotels in Florida, and he speaks around the world sharing practical tools for success, for meaning, and fulfillment. He also hosts uh, the inspirational weekly podcast, Life of Awesome. Saul, it is an honor and pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much, Rabbi. And thanks for that uh, incredible uh, trip down memory lane of all the work I've done in my career. You well, just I'm rattle proud. off a name. Each one of those is years of toil and sweat and uh it's nice to be appreciated, so thank you. And 100%. I hope your kids out there who are watching these shows appreciate all the uh, hard work that we put into them. <laughs> well, you know, I know my kids have, and um, when you see the the look on children's faces, especially when they're when they're your own, I just remember those Sundays. You know, you know, my kids are a little older now, but I remember those Sundays watching like Tarzan and the music and the animation, and it was just. I don't know, it was just a major part of their childhood growing up. Right. And right. Um, so it's, uh, you You bring a lot of joy to a lot of people. Thanks, and Rabbi. Appreciate really, it. Really. So listen, I, I've had the zechut and the pleasure of knowing you for many years, but our listeners do not. Tell us a little about your Jewish background. Let's start there. 
Um, okay, well, Jewishly, uh, it all started with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hey, we all have the same background, guys. Don't ever let anyone tell you different. But uh, you like that, Rabbi? Did I get you laughing on that? Yeah, that was good. That was pretty good, good right? Um, but my personal Jewish background, uh, it has to really be defined by my parents. Um, my parents are very much lovers of Yiddishkeit, Judaism, and Israel. I was raised in what you would call a conservative docs home. Mm -hmm. uh, Shabbos was meaningful. Uh, we lit Shabbat. My mom lit Shabbat candles. My dad said Kiddush. Um, I went to a Jewish camp. But even though I had an extensive Jewish background, when I became an adult, I had to ask myself a question of how do I fit into the Jewish people? Because I realized at a certain point in my life that my entire Jewish identity, and for that matter, the way I lived as a Jew, was really defined by my mom and dad. And once I was becoming an adult, there was a moment, I did have a light switch moment where I realized, wait a minute, maybe I should choose this for myself. And in that case, what will I choose? How do I want to live? I, I didn't really make it real for myself until I was in my 20s and started asking those big questions. Wait, what, what is life about? What is meaning? What is purpose? And that's when I found myself on my, uh, one of my first trips to Israel learning. There's actually a 10-day program uh, called Israelite with, I know you know them well, Rabbi Aaron and Rabbi Benny Friedman. Yeah. And it was that trip that really sparked me. And when you and I met, Rabbi, it was uh, just a couple years later, which was really great that you could facilitate the next level of my growth and learning. You know, the baton was handed to you from them. And I do want to also point out that you signed the ketubah at my wedding. So thank you for that. <laughs> I remember that. And I, I remember that beautiful, beautiful wedding. But, you know, what you just said, Saul, is just so meaningful, I, I think, for so many of our listeners because we all grew up with some level of Judaism from our families. And the question is, at what point do we choose it for ourselves? I love the way you put that. You know, when is that light switch moment for each of us that we get to, we get to choose, not to simply continue what our parents did, but to say, what does Judaism mean for me? Yeah, and, and actually, I really truly believe that that choice is something we should be choosing every single day. Because even what we choose in our 20s, we're going to have new challenges in our 30s. And for every day is a new challenge. And if we have the merit to actually choose every day how we want to live, then it will be more meaningful for us. Because we're never going to be just a robot going through the road. If we can choose every day, you know, today I want to do it. Every time I say I love you to my wife, I'm not going to say, oh, I love you, honey, because I'm leaving the house. And that's what you say when you're married 20 years or when you hang up the phone. You're like, oh, yeah, okay, bye. Love you. Love you says it's just goodbye. No, no. What if I actually every time I said I love you to my wife was like, hold on, babe, before I say anything, I just want to tell you one thing. I know I have to go, but I have to tell you something so important. What is it? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> right? Keep a relationship alive totally. and ultimately give us more meaning in whatever it is we're choosing. You know? Well, what would you say to someone that is just, you know, not so inspired to make that active choice? Meaning, you know, something happened in your life, and even though your parents clearly gave you a lot Jewishly, you know, something came to you and said, wait, I, I got to figure out where I fit in the Jewish story. You know, that's MJE's model. That's really our goal. Like, you just, that could be our next tagline. Um, I should be talking to you about taglines. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So, um, it's just, what would you say to somebody, um, 25 years old, 30 years old, listening to this, you know, who's really never asked themselves that question, but just continues whatever their parents did Jewishly or didn't do Jewishly. Right. I think I would say you owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself to at least explore. Don't make the equation in your head that if I start to learn more about Judaism, I'm going to become orthodox. Don't make that equation in your head. That's not necessarily true. The equation in our heads should be, if I learn more about Judaism, I'll understand more about Judaism. And what Judaism is, says Rev Yitzhak Berkowitz, he says, Judaism is not a religion, it's reality. Judaism is nothing more than a lens to be able to understand the world. It's a lens to understand everything. You want to understand death? What does Judaism say about death? You want to understand marriage? What does Judaism say about marriage? And ultimately what it is, is it's Torah Chaim, tools for living. 
Judaism is not a history book. It is our history. But at the end of the day, it's tools to get us through everything. I'll tell you an example, Rabbi. One of the first things that I learned about when I went on that trip to Israel was the idea of mezuzah. And I remember Rabbi Binny Freeman getting up and saying to our group, we had like three guys and seven women. We were all like in our 20s learning about Judaism. And he looks to us and he says, what's a mezuzah? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I know. My parents have them. I went to Hebrew school. It's the thing on the doorway. And he looks to us and he says, well, what's inside? And I'm like, there's something inside? <laughs> and I thought it was like a piece of art, whatever, you know? And he says, well, inside is a parchment. And written on that parchment is part of the Torah. And he said, the Torah is a love letter from God to humanity. He says, you know what we're commanded to do? We're commanded to take part of that letter from God and put it on our doorway. If, in, if any one of us got a letter in the mail today and the letter return address said the creator of the world, we'd be like, okay, who's playing a joke on me? Okay, that's funny. But if I opened up that letter and that letter started glowing when it was floating, like what would you do? You would Snapchat that. You'd put that on Instagram. You'd be famous. You'd have the God letter. But what you would probably not do is go, you know what? I know the perfect place to put this letter from, from God to humanity. It's going to go in our doorway, honey. And, and the rabbi looked at us and he said, what's up with the doorway? And this is what he said. Change my thinking. He said, a doorway is a place of transition. You go from your home out into the world and you pass through a doorway. And a mezuzah, he said, is not a thing that we place. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to ask myself a question. I'm going out into the world. What kind of a world do I want to create? What am I living for? You know, you have that mezuzah at your door. You're coming into your home. So we should stop for a moment and think, I'm coming into my home. What kind of a home do I want to create? What are the values I want to have in my home? Why do I need a partner to help me create a home? In the days before COVID, I would go to DreamWorks every day. And even though I work in animation and I live in sunny Los Angeles, sometimes work is still work. And it's difficult. And I have tough days. And you know, you're working with people. It's just like everybody's job. Jobs are always jobs because they're called work. Even when you love them, they're difficult. And if I have a tough day and I'm coming home and I'm about to walk into my home, Am I going to bring that heaviness into my home? Do, do I even know what kind of day my wife had? Do I know what kind of day my, my four children had? What, you think seven-year-olds don't have tough days? They do too. Mm -hmm. They get just emotional like we do. So there's that mezuzah can remind me for a moment, wait, I'm coming into my home. You know what? Let me leave my stuff at the door. And the first thing I'm going to do when I walk in is not be like, honey, you're not going to believe the day I had. Oh, and start venting. Maybe, just maybe I'll walk over to my wife and I'll say, honey, how was your day? You see, what Judaism prescribes for us ultimately is that these mitzvahs, these commandments that sometimes might seem strange, go live in a hut outside for a week. It seems strange. If we dig deeper, we'll find there's incredible meaning, and these things can add purpose to every aspect of our life. And that's what I would tell anybody exploring or, or even on the cusp of almost exploring. You owe it to yourself to find out what Judaism is about because you're a Jew. And to identify what something is, you're really identifying what it does. If I call a pencil a pencil, but it never writes, and who cares that it's a pencil? So for me, when I went to Israel, Rabbi, I didn't just say to myself, you know, I'm Jewish, it's enough. For the first time in my life, I didn't want to just be Jewish. I wanted to live Jewish. And that's what I would, I would say to whoever's listening. It's up to you. And you, you owe it to yourself to explore what your history is and how you can make it your own in your own way. Wow. Wow. You, you should be a rabbi, man. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. I mean, really the, the message of owing it to yourself and there's nothing more compelling. Uh, tell us a little, Saul, how all of this has impacted your work, the animation, the films that you've created. Yeah, well, um, you know, when I when I went to Israel, which I said just started the journey, but when I came to the Upper West Side and the learning with MJE, uh, this really is a perfect commercial for you. <laughs> but really, it's uh, MJE, all the classes and the learning and the community. You know, one of the things living in New York was was tough. Is New York's a big, loud, busy city, and to find a community within that was something that was so precious to me and my girlfriend, who later became my wife. And um, I remember as I was in New York directing at MTV, then I returned to Disney, moved out to Los Angeles, and I woke up one day and I realized, you know what, I'm not just a filmmaker, 
I'm a Jewish filmmaker. I started putting the word Jewish as an adjective before everything that I define myself as, okay? I'm not just a son, I'm a Jewish son. How does a Jewish son treat his parents? I'm a Jewish filmmaker, so what did I do? Well, I was directing a Winnie the Pooh movie, like you said before, and uh, in Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, many of your listeners may remember from their childhood, he lives in the 100 acre wood. And Winnie the Pooh lives in a tree. And uh, one of the first things I did the first day when I returned to Disney as a director is I had a giant drawing of the 100 acre wood that I had to approve that came from the layout department. And I'm looking at it. And when it's done, you're supposed to autograph the bottom right. So it goes to the art department to be painted in color. So I'm looking at this drawing and everything looks good. Great. I sign my name and everyone leaves the room. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, don't Disney artists like hide things in the movies? <laughs> you ever heard of those things, Rabbi? Like they hide things. Now, some of them are true and some of them are not. So I'm thinking, you know what? I'm at Disney. I should be hiding something in the movie. So I go over. I sharpen the pencil. And next to Winnie the Pooh's house, I drew in next to his doorway a mezuzah. <laughs> I it. put it in the movie. Now he's not Winnie the Pooh. He's Winnie the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> but I started putting that things into the next movie I directed, Kronk's New Groove. Uh, I was reading the script, and it says Kronk gets married. I'm like, this is great. I'll give him a chuppah. So I gave him a chuppah. I got the wedding album from me and my wife's uh, wedding and the calla lily flowers that she loved. And the, But that was just a fun way to show my Jewish identity. It started really really manifesting itself when I started like keeping Shabbat. That was really the biggest thing. Like mm -hmm. People say to me all the time, so how do you live in Hollywood? And remain an observant Jew. And I say to them, how do you not? <laughs> Hollywood is designed to get your ego, to get in check, to get you that little gold Oscar. Every coffee shop you go into in Hollywood before COVID, there's a writer, a filmmaker. Everybody's trying to advance their careers. If I come home on a Tuesday night, I'm sitting with my family for family dinner, and I get a ping on my phone or a work call. I said, I, guys, I got to go. It's a work call. Oh, the daddy work call. Work comes first. I get it. But you see, Friday night comes along. And that phone rings, and daddy doesn't even go near it. We sit and have Shabbat dinner as a family. My kids don't just think daddy's home. They see daddy is home. And Judaism grounds me. How do I balance it? I, I have, the word is devacus, to cling to it. You know, if you're in the ocean, and, so, and you're drowning and someone throws you a life preserver, you're not going to be like, you know, I may hold on to this for a while. You're going to hold on to whatever thing you have because you know if you let go, you're going to die. Judaism, cling to it. I cling to my Jewish identity. I cling to Shabbat because without Shabbat, if I had to be on that phone, and I'm telling you guys, and you all know, you're all on social media, all the texts, every day there's another social media app that you have to check messages in. It used to just be email. That I could handle. Then it was Facebook. Then it was texting. Then it was LinkedIn and now and Instagram and more. There's so and ever and it's so nice. Every Shabbat, my wife and I say to each other, it's so nice that we can just shut it off, reflect on our week, re-energize, and put that new energy and new clarity into the next week. Judaism grounds me every day of my life. Wow. Wow. I, this is such an important message because e even in COVID, you know, a lot of us, you know, you're in your home. I'm in my home right now. And so we don't have to leave as much, you know, it feels like a little less pressuring, you know, I think that's even more of a reason why Shabbos is more compelling even during COVID now, because that line that we used to have going to the office, coming home, and at least being able to leave something someplace else, yeah. it's gone. You know, my, my office is the same place where I'm, I'm, you know, sitting and hanging out with my kids. It's it, everything is the same. Right. It used to be, it used to be in the nineties, get ready for your audience to hear this, that when you left work, you didn't know a message from anybody till you came back to work the next day. Yeah. Isn't that true? Remember those days? Like you had a little <laughs> red light on your voicemail. Yeah. Or maybe if you were really busy, maybe you would check your voicemail at work from home, like once, maybe on the weekend, maybe. But now it's 24 seven. And if you're that person that says, you know what, I'm still going to hold by that. And you don't answer those texts when you get home, then you, people you work with are going to think you're not really motivated. They're not, they're going to think you're not invested, but Shabbat comes. And by the way, everybody I work with, they totally respect Shabbat. And I hear that a lot from people. They're like, well, you know, I'm in the workplace. And if I tell them that I'm not going to work on Shabbat, then they're not going to like it. They're not going to respect it. And I have found it through my experience that many people seeing the respect that you have, for your own Judaism will have 
much respect for you. And so you, totally- you've never you you you've never felt like it's held you back in any way. No, no. And, but I, I I will say I, I don't think that if you are going to be observant, that you shouldn't take advantage of it. Meaning, you know, if you're working Monday through Friday, then Mondays, if work starts at ten, get there at nine fifty. And just be a little more attentive, you know, whatever responsibilities you have on Friday, make sure you foresee that and let your team aware of it all the time and just make them make sure that they're aware that you're not taking advantage of, of not working. You know, it's important. Wow. Well, that's great advice. So, so look, you're explaining to us how Shabbos and Judaism is keeping you sane outside of the office. Is there, you know, besides sneaking a little mezuzah and a chuppah into Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> what I mean is what is the connection between what you do artistically and and the passion that you have for Yiddish guy you're so passionate Saul of about Yiddish guy I can't believe it just sort of you know is you got your Yiddish guy you got your family life you got your gym then you go to work right. and you work you know what's right. the- it's all the same it's all one right great question Rabbi thank you for for asking that um yeah J- Jewish values are who I am and I put those values into everything that I do. So in my work, as I'm reading scripts or working on things, I am injecting Torah values into everything I do. And not only do I try to put those into everything I do, but they set parameters for what I do and what I will not do. A couple of years ago, I was uh, being um, I was being asked to direct a show at Nickelodeon, a kid's show. And we think just because something's animated or it's a kid's show that it must be okay and appropriate for kids. This was a preschool kids show. I shouldn't probably have said Nickelodeon, but it's okay. I won't mention the name of the show. I don't work there. They can't fire me. They never hired me. So they bring me in and I'm looking at this show and the way these kids are speaking, the crass nature of it. I wanted to say to the guys that created the show, I never did, but I wanted to, do you really want your kids talking like this? Because yeah. all the work that my wife and I have done as a parent, if we showed them the show, it's right out the window. It's, it brings out the negativity in kids. And I, and I said, I, I, can't, I can't work on the show. So Judaism is something that helps set wow. parameters to protect our values. But I do try to not only put Jewish values into everything I do. So like the show I'm working on now at DreamWorks, it's called DreamWorks. Madi- it's called Madagascar A Little Wild. Mm-hmm. And, there's, and there's a lot of really strong values. Or Lama Lama, like you, uh, what you mm-hmm. were mentioning before. That's a show that, that shows the struggles of what it means to, to go through childhood as a kid. Um, but I also get to work on some Jewish uh, uh, projects too. I'm consulting right now on an animated Holocaust movie no. called, the, called The Long Night, which we'll, uh, we're going to be coming out with to marketing for that in the next couple of months. That, that is, I, by the way, that's, you know, I, I, I just, I don't know why I brought up Prince of Egypt recently in one of my classes. Yeah, great movie. It's such a, well, you know, so positive. And I remember my kids being, because I grew up on the Ten Commandments, you know, kill me now, Charlton has the Ten yeah. Commandments. And a little drawn out. It's a little long. It's like, <laughs> um, but let me just, you touched on something before, which is interesting to me. You know, growing up, I always associated animation with children and purity. And here you just gave an example of how animation you know, and, and that's probably that example you gave from Nickelodeon is probably nothing compared to some of the other stuff that's exactly out there. Right. You're exactly right. Yeah. But do you, do you feel that that sort of art form has been co-opted like it should have? You know, uh, I'm just curious. You just- mean this animation strictly for children? No, it's absolutely not. I mean, look, here's the thing. What animation is, is it's art. What's the difference between a painting and photography? Well, a painting is through the lens of an artist. It's... um. It's a comment about life. I'm not saying photography isn't an art form. Of course it is. But to take a photo of your face right now, Rabbi, but to paint your face and choose which colors I'm going to use will have a lot to be on the emotions that I'm feeling. If I'm using more reds or more blues, I can put my own personality into that. So what animation is, is it's just a very emotional, artistic art form. Like you said, Prince of Egypt. Those are moving paintings. One of the most beautiful animated movies ever. It was DreamWorks' first movie, by the way. Um, and uh, we show it to our kids every Passover, every Pesach, while we're getting the table set, everything. That morning, our kids know at noon, they watch Prince of Egypt, mm-hmm. the music fills our house, and then they go take a nap so they can stay up all night. And of course, you know, there's those that say, well, Prince of Egypt, it's not 100% accurate, and blah, blah, blah. But the spirit of that film. It is incredible. It's really incredible. incredible. But yeah, there is a lot of media out there that I think is not in line, and there's a lot of those things. And, uh, you know, I try to do what I can to 
to implement those values in any way that I can. Listen, it's so huge. The the movies and film and it's it, it plays such a tremendous. It has such an impact on on our our whole outlook and vision of life, and um, you know, and and it's you know, as they say in Hebrew, there's yesh for yesh. There's there's this and there's that out there. And it's it's so beautiful to hear that there's somebody. I mean, I've known this, but it's nice to hear that there are these really positive forces out there, especially by the way, Jewish forces. You know, I'm combating. I've spent my life, my whole career, trying to combat intermarriage assimilation and try to get Jews to feel proud because it's all, in my opinion, comes down to Jewish pride. So many sitcoms where Jews are depicted as, you know, making fun of their own Judaism. Yeah. Ignorant yeah. of their Judaism, almost every single. Yeah, there's a great scene in Seinfeld. Why well, I say it's great? I mean, it's funny, but if you think about it, it's not. It's it's the Moyle episode. Have you ever seen Seinfeld? Where there's this Moyle and he comes in, he's like, "Who's holding the baby?" and all this, and uh, he says, and 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 they're they're all questioning him. What is this ritual you're doing? He's like, oh, it's a covenant between Abraham, God, or something. But he doesn't. Really- yeah, or something. Yeah, I don't really know. I don't really know. You know, it's that same thing in Fiddler on the Roof. Why do we do these things? Tradition. Tradition. Now, there's a truth to that. You do it because your parents did it, but he's basically saying, I don't know. I do it because my parents did, not because, well, because it's the right way to live. No, he won't say that. So you're right. In media, uh, Jews are often depicted uh, that way. But there also are moments in films where you can see Jewish values depicted in a responsible way. By the way, even in animation, you know, there's a movie, obviously The Lion King. Everyone's seen that movie. One of my favorite animated movies. But there's a lot of Jewish themes oh, in yeah. those in those yeah. movies. I mean, if you look at that movie, there's a moment in the movie where anyone here has not seen the movie. This is the spoiler alert. And if you haven't seen it in 35 years, you deserve to have it spoiled. Okay. But here we go. Daddy dies. It's a Disney movie. There's always a parent that dies, right? That's how they start, right? right. Ronnie Nemo, right? And uh, anyway, so dad dies, and Simba thinks, first of all, he wants to be king. He tells you in the beginning of the movie, I just can't wait to be king. He thinks being a king means I can do whatever the heck I want. Life's going to be awesome. His father even says to him in the beginning, Simba, there's more to being a king than getting your way all the time. He's like, there's more? So he thinks being a king is I can do what I want. Daddy dies. Simba thinks it's his fault. He goes off to Hakuna Matata world. He's living there with Pumbaa and Timon. Hakuna Matata, right? You remember the song, Rabbi? Yeah, I know. Right. Right? <laughs> it's not John Lennon, but I know you're. You know, I know you're a Lennon fan. So he's singing Hakuna Matata out there. And uh, who shows up midway through the movie? Nala, the little girl line he would play with in the beginning, but now they're both grown up, and they have their song. Can you feel the love tonight? Right, <laughs> my eldest daughter. <laughs> My old star is always like, Dad, if you if you tell part of your story or you mention any Disney stuff, please don't sing. I'm like, why, honey? Would that embarrass you? She's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm definitely going to sing. So they have their song. That was pretty good. That's pretty good, right? They're singing, can you feel love? And the sun is setting and they're rolling around and they're doing their like lion kiss move. Their heads are moving. Together. It's a little strange. I always cover my kids' eyes when they were little when their heads are going together. But they have their moment. And then Nala says to him. She's like, Simba, it's so good to see you, but let me tell you what's been going on at home. Scar's taken over everything, and you need to come back. He's like, nah, nah, I'm not going. Hakuna Matata, I'm staying here. She's like, well, maybe I didn't make myself clear. Scar's taken over everything, and if you don't come back, everyone is going to die, and you are responsible. She says that word, you're responsible. And he's like, you're beginning to act like my father. She goes, at least one of us does. And he's like, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. And you know what she does? She leaves. But wait a minute. I thought a minute ago you were just tossing around in the sunset with him. <laughs> she is Azer Kenegdo, one of the first concepts I ever learned in Torah from Rabbi Aaron, by the way, on that mm-hmm. Israel trip. If you open up the Chumash, if you open up the Chumash, it says that God says it's not good for man to be alone. So I will create for him an Azer Kenegdo, a helpmate that will go opposite him or against him. Meaning, God's saying, you know who your soulmate is? Someone that will help you by going against you. It sounds like, what? How could that be? Usually the person that helps me is supporting me. They're going with me. In any relationship, if two people always have the same point of view, one person is useless. Because if the goal of life is that we're going to grow, then we better have someone's perspective 
to help us do that. If you think right now about all the people that you have, your listeners, think of all the people you have in your life, social media, maybe you have 3,000 friends on Facebook or whatever. If one of those friends on Facebook that you're not even aware of, that you're even friends with, gives you a text and says, you know what? I saw you the other day. You were acting a little arrogant. You'd be like, who are you to talk to me? I don't even know you. We're Facebook friends. I didn't even know you were a deep friend, whatever. You're gone. But hopefully there's someone as you get closer, like the rings of a tree, that's closer to you where they can actually tell you, you know what? You acted a little arrogantly the other day. And you would look at that person and go, thank you. Now I have the answer key to grow. Because at the end of the day, if you have one person, just one person who you trust enough that they can tell you anything because you know that they're on your side, that is value. And God says it is not good for a person to be alone. There's one person for you. You need someone that will help you by going against you. And the Hebrew mm-hmm. word is Azer Kenegdo. And that's exactly what Nala does. You heard it right here. There is Torah values in the Lion King. Oh. She, she leaves. He's left alone. He looks into the water, meets her fiki. Let me just jump in if we can, because I just think you just described such an important concept that I think would be helpful for people's dating and Mm. building. Yeah, yeah. Because we all want to find someone who's going to love and support us. But what kind of love and support should we ideally be looking for? You said it so beautifully, Saul. It's someone that is going to challenge you to become better. Period. You're not a yes person. You're going to end up with yourself (laughs) the same way going forward. And the other thing you just touched and on. And you won't respect them in the long run. You won't respect that person. You, you really won't. I guess you think about anyone in your life who only yeses you and only compliments you and never pushes back a little. At some point, it just ceases to be interesting. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, I'll tell you something else, which you what you just said about Azer Connecto and you touched on social media. So I'm publishing later today. I'll send it to you, if, or you can check on my Facebook a, a, a blog that I just wrote about dating, friendships, and relationship marriage. Oh, cool. oh wow! And it has to do with the same exact issue because if we continue to defriend those with whom we disagree, if we continue to only surround ourselves with people who agree with us and uh, share the same vision and create what they call this little echo chamber, right. where you know we're just not going to grow. Right. We're not going to grow. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you look at, just look at any, any successful person in history, you know, I guarantee Steve Jobs, when he finished creating the first iPhone, I guarantee he brought his people around. I don't know this, but I can guarantee he probably brought them in a conference room, gave them a lachaim. Congratulations. We created the first iPhone. He probably looked at them next and said, now come in tomorrow and tell me how we're going to make it better. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite stories, look, I grew up in the 90s and my favorite basketball player was Michael Jordan. Yeah. I have this conversation with my son. His friends are like LeBron James, LeBron James. And my son is a diehard Jordan fan like mm-hmm. me. And he has to stick up for Michael all the time. But Michael Jordan was in the NBA the first year. That's a true story about him. He's already aired Jordan. He already has posters on everyone's walls around the world. He's making a gajillion dollars a game. A sports writer comes up to him after one of the games and says, Michael, you're a scoring machine, but your defense, it's not so strong. Do you know what Michael Jordan could have said to the guy? Could you get out of my way? I'm going to the locker room. I'm going to go take a shower now. I just made a million dollars, maybe more, playing basketball, running up the court. I'm going to listen to you. Your kid's probably wearing my Air Jordan sneakers. I'm going to listen to you. But years later, Michael said he heard one thing. Something I'm doing is giving that guy the perception that I don't have a defensive game. I guess I better work harder on defense. And he did. And next year in the NBA, one player was named Defensive Player of the Year. Number 23, Michael Jordan. Because at the end of the day, if we're really going to grow, then the flaws that we are aware of, we should turn into strength. That is the answer key to growing. And think about what we portray on social media for a second. I'm happy you brought that up, Rabbi. Think about Facebook. We all look perfect. No one's showing their flaws. No one's like videoing an argument they have with their wife. Like, honey, let's show them how we really fight. Let's do it. My kid's screaming and crying in front of the Disney castle by the working at Disney World all those years. You always see those pictures of that perfect family in front of the castle. I had I had an office in Disney World, and I was walking by that castle every day. And can I tell you how many family fights I saw in front of that <laughs> castle? How many times did I see parents screaming and crying and the kids smile, and they go back to screaming and crying like all the time? <laughs> but no one's going to show that on Facebook. But when you close the door and you think about the relationships you have to take work, 
the hardest relationship, the most difficult relationship that we'll ever have is the one with ourselves. Think of all the lists we have right now of how we wish everyone could be different. I could make, if you work for anyone in any workplace, you could easily make a list of how they should change. Oh, if I was running the company, I'd do it this way. If you're lucky enough and your parents are still alive and you're upset that they're telling you what to do all the time, believe me, you could make a list of how I wish my mom would talk to me different or my dad would talk to me different. All the lists that we have in our head, judging and deciding how everyone else should be living, do we make those lists? about us, the person we actually can control, that's where we have to do the work. And in order to do that work, really, we need to have that one person where we can be vulnerable. That's what intimacy really is. Intimacy is nothing less than vulnerability, where I can say to my wife, honey, I'm working on this. By the way, you don't even have to say it. You know, in the secular world, they tell you love is blind. Judaism says love is a magnifying glass. When you love someone, you know all their flaws. Do I love my children? Oh, yeah. Do they have flaws? Oh, yeah. Just like their dad does. Does it mean I love them any less? No. Love is choosing to identify and appreciate the positive attributes of something. Love is a choice. But at the end of the day, I must have somebody who I can be real with. And for those of you out there that are single right now, I would say I say this all the time. There's one quality above all that you must be able to be ensured that this person you're dating sitting across from you at that table has. And that is, is this a person that sincerely wants to grow? Because if they want to grow, then the foundation of that is they have a little bit of humility and they're also going to need someone to help them grow. And you know who that person's going to be? You. Because if they're a person that comes off and they're like, hey, I got it all. Wow, Ma, this, 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 this girl I'm dating, we could talk for hours and She's got it all. She doesn't have any space for me. Or you're dating this guy and he's like, he's so cool. He makes so much money. He's real great. That's the guy that may not really need you. Have someone that looks into your eyes and doesn't say they really, really want you. They say they really, really need you. For what? In order to grow. Because that ultimately is where purpose comes from. Do I work on myself every day? And I'll tell you, Rabbi, I think about this a lot. Is at the end of the day. You know, someday, you know, not to be morbid, but we, first of all, I've had a lot of death in my family in the last couple of months. Yeah. And, we're, and, and yeah, it's it's been really difficult. I lost my grandfather and my first cousin and my grandfather just last week. And I'm still very raw from it, but we're all surrounded by death. I mean, the last year we were surrounded by death. And when you're surrounded by death, it gets you to ask those questions about your life. You know, there's an idea and Rabbi, you can tell the source better than I can. There's an idea that if you had to choose to go to a wedding or a funeral, that you choose a funeral. And most people are like, why would I choose a funeral over a wedding? Because when you leave a wedding, it's joyous, it's a simple, it's wonderful. But when you leave a funeral, there's an idea that goes through everyone's heads, consciously or subconsciously, which is someday that's going to be me. And the power, the transformational opportunity that I have when I contemplate that I'm going to die one day should motivate me to really live. And to leave was, a funeral. Uh, by the way, that's that's Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech, I think, from Sefer Kohelet. Is that it? And, uh, he says, better to go to a house of mourning than a house of feasting. Ah. And I tell you, Saul, this is so powerful, what you're sharing, because, you know, it's not about death, obviously. It's about inspiring us to live our best lives. Exactly. But when I was a rabbi, before I started MG on the east side at KJ, um, the first question on my interview, uh, and you should live and be well, Rabbi Lukstein, one of my mentors, and when he interviewed me, the first question he had was, are you a Kohen? Now, if that's the first question you get on a rabbinic interview, you know where you're spending the next couple of years, which is in oh, a graveyard. That's right. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I, I remember those were the days when we had, uh, what do you call them? Like um, on the bottom of your pants, when they when they tuck up a little, what is that called? Um, not a pleat, um, cuffs. Cuffs, 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 cuffs. yeah. Cuffs right. not in anymore. But no. all, my, all my suits had cuffs, and all of my cuffs had dirt from the graveyard wow. in them. I was in the, you know, it's an, it's a right. staff congregation, very lively, but also as a low, uh, you know, a large, larger, older congregation. So I was in the cemetery every week. And I will tell you something, even though that sounds morbid and dour, I think, you know, there was a certain perspective that it, it kept a certain perspective alive and appreciation for life when you have that. So your, your point is ex exactly, and, and we should find ways, you know, for those of us that aren't at, 
you know, funerals every day. We should all have a moment every day where we try to just realize the gift. And it sounds like a cliche, but really the gift of what it is to be alive. You know, we're told every day that the first things we say when we wake up is moda'ani, the first two words out of our mouth. You know, if you think about it like this, when you're in your 20s or 30s or any day for that matter, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing in your head is I'm going to kill it today. It's whether it's at work or relationships, all the things I'm going to get done today. We have that fire. You know what I have in front of me? A whole day. And as the day goes and time starts to get lost, as we get towards the night, we start to realize, yeah, maybe I accomplished some things, but there's a lot more I want to accomplish. If you're like me, that when your head hits that pillow at the end of the day, you may have a deflating, oh man, I only got to like 20% of what I wanted to get accomplished, right? Because that's real. Because we have so much we want to do. And then we wake up the next day and we're going to kill it again. And God says to us, I'm going to give you a great tool to get through your day. The first thing you're going to do when you wake up, before you even get that mindset of I'm going to kill it, I'm going to do all these, I'm going to accomplish, is the moment of gratitude. The very first things we're supposed to say or think about when we wake up in the morning is thank you. Mode ani. I am thankful. You know, I have teenagers. Imagine my teenagers walk into the breakfast nook in the morning and the first thing out of their mouth before they say, hey, can I have money today or I want to do this? Imagine they walk into the breakfast nook and the first thing they say is, mom, dad, thank you. You know what it'll do? Will it make mom and dad proud? Yeah. You know what it does for the teenagers? Changes their day. It's 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 a, it's a total game changer. It changes their day. By the way, it's when we, when we eat food, we say a blessing. We have an opportunity to say a blessing. You're about to eat the greatest yellowtail sushi in history. You want to take that physical experience and make it amazing? Say thank you before you eat it. You just took something physical and you transcended it and made it amazing. You made it awesome. All right. So, guys, I don't I don't want any of these very beautiful and deep messages that Saul is sharing with us to go, you know, to, to be missed. OK, so number one, humility. We just talked about what to look for in a spouse, in a potential mate, not someone who's who's arrived, but someone who's still growing, who's still learning. And we are looking for someone to help fill in some of our gaps, of course, an Azer Connecto and a helpmate against us and the concept of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. Very, very powerful stuff. And, and by the way, Rabbi, I can tell you, look, I'm, um, uh, this is, I love seeing the comments from your, your students. This is incredible. Thank you, Ben. It's so cool to see people writing. I've never seen this before. This is awesome. Um, it, it's also, look, my, my wife and I are going to be married 19 years coming up uh, this week. Thank God. And uh, about 19 years ago, Rabbi, you were at that wedding. Mazel tov. Thank God. You, you were wearing cuffs 19 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. And um, and 19 years ago, uh, you know, we stood under the hoop. It was like a Disney movie, right? I mean, you're getting married. If there's ever a moment in your life that feels like a Disney movie, it should be your wedding. And for my wedding, there was an animated bird on my shoulder, right? Everything amazing. And uh, And, you know, 19 years later, we could be hosting a Shabbat dinner and I'm leaving the supermarket and for like the second time to go get food that my wife needs. Cause you know, Rabbi, when your wife is creating a Shabbos feast for guests Friday, it's like stay out of her way, stay out of the kitchen. It actually starts on Thursday. Let's be honest. Fridays are very, very dangerous places. Right. Places. Right. So imagine I'm leaving the supermarket and then there's that name, that phone rings. It's my wife. And I know if I pick up that phone, She's going to be like, honey, can you go back and get like one more thing? So what am I going to do? Not pick up? It's my wife. God's watching. Of course, I got to pick up my wife. There's people we don't pick up for, but there's people, your wife, your spouse, you got to pick up. So I get on the phone and I'll be like, uh, hi, honey, what? She'll be like, oh, can you go back to Trader Joe's and get, and I'm like, honey, I was just there three times. Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> right. And so what am I going to do? The words that I used under the chuppah that I said to her, I love you. When Every time I said that when we were falling in love. There's a burst of pixie dust around us. I know what I'll do. I'll use those words again. It's like what I was mentioning earlier. You say, I love you to get off the phone. I'll be like, okay, honey, I'll go. But I love you. I love you. Hang up the phone. But instead, I pick up the phone and I realize that as difficult as my situation is, she's going through it much worse because she has four kids at home and she's juggling. And we have a puppy now, by the way. Oh, no. I saw your face. And you went, ooh. You weren't like, oh. You're like, oh, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Oh, there's my wife. She's watching too. She just made some funny. Hey, hello, hello, hello. There she is. See that smile? See, if I focus on her, 
you know, I focus on her needs and not you know, my. I, I have to tell you, Mary. Uh, Mary, I just called you by your wife's name. That's okay. Um, she's listening. I have to tell you though that this um, this is very challenging um, for people. Your your whole raison d'etre. I can't even say it. I don't speak French, but your whole mahus in Hebrew, we say your essence, and what you're sharing with us is all about the other. It's getting out of ourselves. And thinking about when when you come home, you want to unload. I do this all the time about my day, and right. just me, me, me. That right. up. How do you get? How do we? How do we switch from our own? You know, we are self-absorbed people by nature. How do we get out of ourselves? Because that's really what's going to because, enable. Because yeah. there's there's because we know it. The pleasure we get from putting someone else's needs before our own. It's just, it's more pleasure. And I'm not just saying it should be more pleasurable. It actually becomes, I mean, I see that with our kids all the time. My wife and I trying to nurture our kids and teach our kids and give them the script for life and let them know what they need to be saying or feeling in certain circumstances and help them overcome that. Oh, it's all about me. You know, when kids wake up every day, it's all about me. I have these conversations with friends a lot. Most people think the goal of life is happiness. If you ask everybody, what's the goal of life? To be happy. And Judaism says, no, there's something better. There's something much better. Like, what do we say in New Year's during the secular world? We just got out of New Year's, right? What does everyone say to everyone? They go, happy New Year. That's a blessing. I'm giving you a blessing. Happy New Year. You know what I want for you to have? If there's one thing I want for you to have this entire year, happiness. And how do they celebrate being alive? Most people, they get drunk. <laughs> New Year's Eve, I got to get drunk. It's New Year's, I got to get drunk. They get so drunk, they don't even realize they're alive. You know what Judaism says? We have our new year. It's called Rosh Hashanah. We don't say Happy New Year. We say Shana Tova. No. Because there's something I want for you that's actually better than happiness. You know what it is? It's called Tov. It's good. Because what makes you happy may not be what's good for you. I want something good for you that you may not even be aware of yourself. I want that for you. And I think that the more that we realize that there's this concept of truth, and values outside of us, and we want to cling on to that, we'll see that the pleasure we get from growing personally and putting someone else's needs before our own, it's so much better. It's so much better that when you can share with someone. And most people will think to themselves, yeah, I'm a giving person. If you had a candle and, and someone had a, a candle and you light their candle, you just gave them fire. Yeah, they can go cook. They have light. Did you give up anything? No. You still have your fire. I'm a giving person. I feel good about myself. Yeah. Yeah. Would, would you give the person your candle if they didn't even have one? Would you be able to be in the dark while they now have fire? Well, I don't know about that. Because when we can do that and realize that we're still okay, the pleasure we get, it's it's manifested in so many bigger ways. Winston Churchill has a beautiful quote that my wife and I have been quoting for 20 years. He said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Beautiful. Really beautiful. And by the way, the Hebrew word, as you know, Rabbi, love, ahava, the root of that word, hav, if you want to understand what anything is, you have to look at what the Hebrew is. The Hebrew tells us what something really is, love, ahava, the root of that word is hav, which literally means to give. Most people think that love is how I feel as a result of someone else. Judaism says, no, love is one thing, a verb. It's making a decision to give to someone else. And that's but, what marriage is. I, I guess if we, if we really believed... In other words, it's not just some theoretical thing. If, if we can ask, if everyone here just take a moment, think about the last time you really felt joy and happiness. And I'm wondering if those thoughts are going to take us to some, I don't know, vacation spot where we had this just, you know, tequila out on the, on the, on the, on the water, or was it actually when we did something for somebody else? Because yeah. if, we, if we could actually go back to that place, it's just going to encourage us to continue to perform acts of chesed, perform because, and, and it's, we always look at it as this altruistic, you know, you know, wonderful thing that we would do for somebody else. But if we could really be convinced that it's the best thing that we can do for ourselves, the more you give, the more you get, as you said, beautifully. For sure. Yeah. We would just be, we'd just be doing it more and more. It'd be contagious. And by the way, if you go back to Lion King, I'm going to bring Disney back into this for a minute. You got the Disney guy. I have to do it. But if you go back to Lion King, after Hakuna Matata world and Nala leaves him, 
right? Remember she leaves him. She's Azer yeah, connector. Yeah, she goes, yeah, yeah. he's sitting there. He looks into the water after Rafiki. He sees his father's reflection. Remember who you are. You remember the scene, Rabbi? Love right? That. Love that. All right. And then he goes back and he, he beats Scar and he climbs Pride Rock. And the reason that movie became the biggest animated movie of all time is not because we love movies about lions, because that movie was nothing about lions. That movie was about us getting a vision in our heads. You know what I want in life? I want meaning. And meaning comes, says Judaism, from taking responsibility. Life is not about how do I sit in Hakuna Matata world and make sure I have everything. Life is looking around the world and seeing where I can take responsibility for the world. And as Rabbi Seidenfeld beautifully says, responsibility is the ability to respond. Wherever in our lives we have the ability to respond, Judaism says we're responsible. Years ago, I was flying on a plane and uh, I just, uh, I was flying, I was going to go speak at, uh, I think it was uh, Tufts University, mm -hmm. really sharp kids there. And I was taking the red eye. When I land, I have to be refreshed because I'm going to speak to 100 kids and they're going to be sharp kids and I got to get my rest. And my goal in that plane is one thing. I need to sleep. And I want to sleep right by the window because if there's anyone sitting next to me for that flight, they're going to get up and go to the bathroom. They're going to wake me up asking up something my sleep. So I get to the flight. And I'm like, I'm in a window. They're like, no, I'm sorry. We have you in a middle. I'm like, ah, oh, it's not going to work. She's like, we don't have anything. She goes, actually, you know what? I can give you an aisle. I'm like, okay, I'll take the aisle. I guess it's better than the middle. So I go to the plane and I'm getting on the plane. And I see in front of me, as I'm getting on the plane, in one of the uh, aisles there, there's a very religious couple. And how do I know? Because they have like 10 kids under the age of four, okay? And there's a guy in one aisle, and behind them is physically possible. It's not possible, yeah. but you know, it's a caricature. <laughs> so behind him is his wife. She's in the other aisle, and they're passing kids over the aisle. And we've been there, Rabbi. You know you've been there. And one of the diapers is dirty. I mean, you ever seen when you're getting on a plane? The plane hasn't taken off yet, and they already look like they're settled in for an hour. You know what I mean? Like, how many? They've changed three diapers. They know the flight attendant's names and, like, everything. And you're still, even with your luggage, I'm getting on this plane. And as much as I would love to sit next to a beautiful Jewish family, all I'm thinking is, God, please have me as far away from them as possible because <laughs> I need to sleep. And I see in front of me this, this Latina woman, and she looks at her uh, ticket and she notices that she's supposed to be sitting next to this this from woman this religious mm -hmm. woman and the woman's face turns white and her husband says honey like we got to go so they they go sit next to this woman and i look at my seat number i'm in row 23 i'm a michael jordan fan i'm like this is amazing hashem <laughs> loves me i'm his greatest pride you know i'm bouncing back to my seat in the plane and i get to the seat and i'm sitting in the aisle like i was supposed to the plane starts filling up and the entire plane fills up. The flight attendant closes the door. I'm sitting in the aisle. And you know who's sitting next to me on both seats? No one. The entire plane is full in some miraculous way. Remember, she told me there were no seats. Not only did I get the aisle, I got the middle and the window. I got the, I can lay down the whole way. How lucky am I? Think of the story I would have when I get home. Honey, a miracle happened. Hashem loves me. I wear my kippah on the plane. Look what he gives me because I'm the religious Jew. And I sit back there and I got my noise canceling, you know, Bose headphones, you know, shh, <laughs> silence, right? I got my smart water because, as I say, I think you are what you drink, right? <laughs> and uh, everything's perfect. And I close my eyes. And then all of a sudden I open them again and I go, wait a minute. I'm wearing this. I'm a Jew. Life's not about me just sitting here having three seats for myself. I get up. I go I were my being. I go oh. up to that Latina woman and her husband. I said, "Hey, I got some extra seats in the back. If you got, uh -oh. you never saw a woman run so fast. <laughs> this woman ran to the back, and now the couple sits next to each other. So, did I give up a little of my own physical comfort? Yeah, but I get to have something so much more pleasurable than physical comfort. I get to have something called meaning." And meaning comes when we look around our lives in any small way and see where do I have the ability to respond. That's where I can take responsibility for the world. Wow. Wow. That's an amazing story. I really don't believe you ever did it, and but I appreciate you making it up. <laughs> and I don't care how great of a tzaddik you are, so nobody does that. I'm just kidding. That I, don't do I don't do it all the time. But at least I try. <laughs> I want to mention one other thing. And, and, when I, and by the way, Rabbi, when I don't do it, it's my wife and kids that get me to do it. Uh, that's what we that's going to surround ourselves with people that can, you know, go against us. 
Well, you know, the the um, one of the biggest, I think, um, distinctions between Judaism, Jewish law, and secular law is the concept of mitzvot versus rights. See, we live in a society where we are entitled to certain inalienable rights, and we're proud of that. And there's something very positive about that, that we are all entitled to, we have a right to this, we have a right to that. Judaism's focus, as you know, is all about responsibility, as you're saying. It's all about not what we are entitled to, but what we are obligated and commanded to actually do. Now, that's a turnoff. When someone hears that, they're like, who wants to live in a world where I'm, I must do A, B, and C? I'd rather move to that country <laughs> right. where, where I'm entitled to A, B, and C. I want to do what I want. Who wants to be obligated? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. But the, the trick and the, 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 uh, the secret sauce of Judaism is that that's exactly where happiness is found. Happiness is found in what we are obligated to do. Gadol mishutzuvim ve'osem mishainim mitzuvah ve'osem, the Gemara says. The Talmud says, greater is the person who's commanded and does than who does it on their own volition, which sounds counterintuitive. But again, calling, your, calling or responding, as you say, to something you're responsible to do fills us with so much more meaning and purpose than simply getting something because you're entitled to it. It reminds me of a story I heard years ago of an elderly couple. I haven't, I haven't thought about this in years, and I hope I don't mess it up, but I think there was, a, there was a woman, it was an elderly couple, they're married like 60 years. She's in the hospital, and uh, her husband comes to see her every day, something like that, and someone overhears the woman speaking, and, they, and the woman is upset Oh, that's right. The woman overhears her husband saying to someone that he's coming to see her, take care of her out of obligation, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the woman gets offended. She's like, I can't believe your husband comes to see you out of obligation. And like, that's, that, that's his motivation. He should want to come see you. And the old woman says, no, no, no. The fact that he sees our marriage as an obligation, putting his feelings and emotions left, you know, it says in the Shema, Lo sasuru don't run after your eyes and your heart. We say it in the Shema, don't let your emotions dictate. They say in the secular world, follow your heart. Judaism says, don't follow your heart, follow your head. Don't do something because it feels good. Do it because it's the right thing to do. And when you know it's the right thing to do, then you put your heart into that. To do something because it's the right thing, not letting us be motivated by emotions and feelings because whatever makes us happy one day could frustrate us the next day. Are my kids great? Yeah, most of the time. Sometimes I would love to run away from the house, get in a car and drive away, never see them again. But I have a responsibility. And I know that whenever a kid drives me crazy and I work on my own patience or whatever it is as a dad and I can stick with whatever the responsibility is, I grow from it. You don't handle those obligations, you don't grow. If it's just going on our emotions and our, th our it, there's no growth. Wow. wow. Yeah. Well, let's 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 end on your kids because you're obviously a very proud father, and yeah. I'm getting such nachas hearing and just watching you so animated. Haha, <laughs> that's your word. Uh, talking about your children, how did you get them uh, involved a little and, and tell us a little about what they're doing, and we'll uh, sure, we should all sure. end on the future. Okay. Um, well. You know, we have, uh, you know, just we have four kids. We have three girls and a boy. Our oldest girl is going to be getting her license, please God, this week, Whoa. Uh, which is crazy. She's a really yeah. good driver, very safe driver. So all is good. Don't worry if you're out there on the roads. She's fine. Um, we have a seven-year-old daughter and, and everyone in between. And um, when our kids were young, we noticed that they could sing really well. And we, our son sp specifically, when he was six years old, we got an audition that came in for a movie from Sony. So we thought maybe he could do this audition for this role. So how do you know that a kid can do it? A kid who can't read has to go in and do what's called a line read. The director will give them a line and the kid will follow. So if a director says the line like, hey, dad, when can we go? The kid has to hear those as notes. Bah, 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 bah. And our son could go, but dad, when can we go? And he hit the emotion perfectly. So we're like, let's send him in for this audition. Now, it's one thing for him to do lines at home in your living room, but to go into a room where there's strangers and mommy and daddy can't go in in a sound booth. So he goes in there. And we're listening to the door. You know, we're parents, stage parents. But was stage he was right excited there. about this? Oh, yeah. He was excited. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, he didn't know what it was. He's like, sure, I'll go do those lines that you 
mm-hmm. taught me to do it. Sure. So he goes in there and we're, our ears are pressed to the door, Rabbi. We're listening. And he goes, but dad, he does all the lines great. There's like a hundred kids in the waiting room. It was like a long wait. And a couple weeks later, we found out that he got the job and he got to do uh, the voice for the character, Dennis, the little redhead kid in the movie Hotel Transylvania 2 wow. and 3 and uh, soon to be 4, please God. And um, <laughs> wow. and it was really cool because when you went to Sony Studios and you saw on the wall, you saw pictures of Adam Sandler, Andy Samberg, Selena Gomez, Ashi Blinkoff with his big <laughs> with his big kippah with his Hebrew. Wow. Actually, one time my wife and I were hosting a Shabbat meal and uh, it's I pick him up from school Friday. And we're in the big minivan, you know, and he's asleep drooling in the back with his keep over his head. And I get a text from my wife. You got to take him over to Sony right now. They need to record like a couple lines to make their deadline. I'm like, but he's asleep and we're hosting. She's like, you got to go. They need this one line. So I drive to Sony, which is not that far from our home. And I drive in there and I'm thinking one thing. They're going to tell me to park in this big structure on the right. I'm going to have to wake him up and walk him across the entire lot. This is past like 30 different huge warehouse style soundstage buildings wake him up just to do that line and walk back to make it home for shabbat it's gonna be crazy as i'm pulling in i'm like you know i'll just ask the guy i'll just ask the guy at the gate there so i go to the guy at the gate i'm like listen i got like the main character of hotel transylvania back here i and i just really can i just park over there he's like well who do you have i go i have asher he's like no no problem i'm uh-huh. like really thank you i'm driving in and I hear him say to the other guy, you know who he's got in there? He's like, who? He goes, Usher. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. He thought I had the R&B star. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I did not correct him and tell him that I had okay. a observant okay. little Jew with a, a little thing. But yeah, so Ashi got to do the voice. It was really cool. And also, it was, a, it was a beautiful thing that when they had the premiere, it was on Shabbat. So when we told them we couldn't go to the premiere, they had a special premiere just for our family and friends and all Ashi's friends at the studio's. To watch the movie, they had a theater uh, there, and they brought him like been, toys. For the kids. Thrilled. So it's been a lot of fun to do the uh, voiceover, and um, you know that was when he was six. Now he's going to be bar mitzvah, please God, this year. Wow. Um, but the kids, thank God, they're doing great, and and they're growing, and and they're doing music and and learning, and uh, you know, thank God, uh, I can't complain. Really, really happy. You have uh, having met your children numerous times, and they are just so delicious, and you should have continued nachas from them. And so, you from your musical Havdalas with oh, your, your you. son. If, if those listening have not seen the Wilds musical Havdala family extravaganza, they're, they're really beautiful, Rob. I love that you – have you been posting them lately? I haven't yeah, seen one you know, of them. Saturday night, you know, Yosef's, yeah. after, Yosef's in Israel, so he, it's one in the one or two in the morning for him when we do it. But we've been actually using the same stream. Oh, format? Okay. Now it's I'll been luck. Great. Yeah, listen, but, it's I miss him, and it's a Rabbi, way. Do you remember when your son was speaking, was singing with you outside the Pesach program, and we walked by, and my son joined your son to sing. Ashi was like uh-huh. little at the time, and your son was such a mensch to bring Ashi over, and they were harmonizing together. I don't know if you remember that. I, I, it was, wow, it was a beautiful moment. Our boys, our boys, <laughs> pretty cool. Well, I look forward. Uh, I look forward to spending another Pesach with you and your beautiful family. Amen. I mean, in and person. I thank you. I thank you for all your friendship and mentorship and wisdom and guidance and warmth and love. And uh, New York City is so lucky to have you in that program. And whoever is on listening right now, um, you're already a king and a queen that you have an awareness of Rabbi Wilds and MJE and all the program they're doing. And each one of you should take an accomplished moment and realize how nice it is that you took time from your day to listen and to engage in the programs that Rabbi Wiles uh, and Jill do. So Yash talk to you, Rav. And again, thank you. On behalf of my wife also, we thank you for your influence in our life. And we actually have the old pamphlet from MJE from back in the day when we were 20. We were like the little poster child, Saul and Marion picture. You made that. You made that. You were like, you were literally our poster child for my, for my Wednesday <laughs> night basic Judaism class. That's right, which we love. I still have my notes. But anyway, thank you for having me. Oh and inviting Look, me. Thanking you, man. You're, you're, you gave us so much of your time and your wisdom. And uh, you're just so, you, you really bring honor to, to, the, to the term animation because you are animated with the values of Torah Judaism. And thank you for sharing them with us, Saul. It really means thank a lot you. to me. Personally. And my wife will kill me if I don't say, please come check out my podcast. She'd be oh, like, okay. tell me about your podcast. So I have to tell you, uh, it's on Apple. It's everywhere. It's uh, it's called Life 
of awesome. But if we say it in the real voice, it's life of awesome. There you go. There's the voice. Well, uh, you can check out my you, website. I, I'm going to. Uh, Jill, that was Jill who just sends her love, and she's oh, so hi, Jill. right now. Okay, Life of awesome, guys. Everyone who's listening to this, check out Saul's podcast. I've listened to it. It's excellent. Thanks, and you know, we look forward to uh, continuing the conversation, my friend. And check me out on Instagram, too. See? I, I, I'm, I'm, it's 2021. I'm on Instagram now, so check me out there, too. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, my friend. Have a wonderful day. Send the love. Love Thank to you. the whole family. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, time, buddy. I really Bye -bye. appreciate it. You, too.